new year, new prop, and hopefully new ways to spread my content around. Overall, sir, you will kill. If you've been stalking my Twitter.com over the past year or so, you may have picked up on the fact that I've gotten into a little show called Forged in Fire. Honestly, I never expected a show about competitive bladesmithing to grab me like it has, but here we are. In particular, one of the judges on the show, Doug Markaita, is a martial arts instructor. As such, his philosophy is that a weapon should be used in order to protect others. This plays into when he performs the kill test on the show, and how his pronunciation of the word is actually an acronym. Keep everyone alive. So, in the spirit of the show, which recently celebrated its 200th episode, wow, that's a lot of ballistic dummies and animal carcasses, I'm counting down some of the most epic swords ever to be swung with the press of a button. As long as it primarily remains used as a sword, and as long as it can slice and dice, it's eligible for this list. And this was honestly one of the toughest lists for me to decide on, since there are so many good candidates to choose from. With all that said, Bladesmiths, welcome to my kill test. It's game time! Normally you'd want a sword to be lighter and well-balanced, so that any warrior can wield it without risking their tendons being torn to shreds. But some threats just require a blade that was meant to be wielded by a first-class fighter. Final Fantasy VII's iconic Buster Sword is a heavy beast of a blade, which goes without saying, just from looking at the damn thing. Imagine if you took Guts' Dragon Slayer from Berserk, drilled a couple of holes into it, and made it somewhat more wieldable. It also has quite a bit of history behind it as well, as elaborated on in Crisis Core. Its first wielder, Angel Hewley, rarely used it because it costs so much. His father worked himself to death paying off the debt from commissioning it, it was later entrusted to Zack Fair, who wielded the blade as a symbol of his pride, passing it down to Cloud Strife after Shinra's goon squad gunned him down. Again, the fact that modified super soldiers were needed to wield this speaks to the fact that no ordinary man could use that thing. But as titanic as this sword is, Cloud's signature weapon is just what he needs to cleave his way through any threat, be it corporate goons, military weapons, or silver-haired mama's boys. Ironic that Square Enix is showing interest in NFTs given the plot of FF7 in the first place. Truth be told, I'm more into NFDs myself. As in NFDs, no! Some say that a warrior's best friend is his blade. While I get that idea from a metaphorical standpoint, I'd rather go into battle with an actual living friend. I mean, it'd be pretty weird having deep, meaningful conversations with a sword. Okay, I get the example, but that's not quite what I had in mind in this case. Oh, hey, I get to talk about Dust again. Have I told you how much I love this game? Yes? Well, I'm gonna talk about it again. A labor of love that meshes beautiful presentation, a gripping story, and brilliantly executed combat, this is a gift to those who love exploration-based platformers. And at the root of this game's combat is Dust's signature weapon, and primary guide, the Blade of Ara, one of the five blades of Elysium. Ahem! You are not welcome here! You know the old legends of a sword choosing its master? Well, in Dust's case, it happens quite literally, as the game's main quest begins with Ara literally flying into Dust's hands. From there, the blade guides Dust on his journey to recover his memory, and later defeat General Gaius. Between the sword, Fidget, and Dust himself, Ara is the voice of reason among the three, and will periodically even teach Dust new moves. Of course, given that the game hinges on the big mystery, it becomes increasingly clear that Ara knows more than it lets on. The sword itself distinguishes itself with its star-shaped head and its unusual prongs near the tip. As a weapon on its own, it is very light, fast, and sharp. Dust can wield it one-handedly with amazing efficiency, to the point where he can spin it around to perform the versatile Dust Storm attack with Fidget's help. And when you consider all the various acrobatic sword skills that Dust can perform with Ara in his hand, it makes you wonder how much is Dust's doing and how much is the sword. I mean, when the sword itself is alive, you gotta wonder. 
A tale of souls and swords and yeah, you know the rest. Namco's fighting game division is pretty much as all-in on Tekken as Capcom's fighting game division is on Street Fighter. And the premier 3D weapon-based fighting game is grumbling in the corner like, Bruh, excuse me, I just got rebooted! So while we wait and see what Namco Bandai will do next for the series, if they actually do anything, let's sweep up the stage of history and talk about the two swords that caused the stage to get all messed up in the first place, Soul Edge and Soul Calibur. I feel it's only right to talk about both of them here because, let's be honest, these are two sides of the same coin you popped into the cabinet in the arcade. So first, let's talk about Soul Edge. Dangerous thing it is, a cursed sword with an unhealthy appetite for human souls. Yeah, I've done some research. Souls really aren't that good for you. Full of trans fats, you know? Its list of crimes include turning people into monsters, driving them insane with bloodlust, you know, the standard evil sword curse checklist, complete with a living eye. In gameplay, it takes many forms, but with similar abilities and drawbacks. Namely, draining your health in exchange for crazy power. Its most notable wielders were Siegfried, who was twisted into the infamous Nightmare by its power, and the dread pirate Cervantes, who was the villain in the first game. In ages past, however, the hero king Algol was able to control it. Of course, when it was stolen by his son, he was forced to create a force to counter it. That counter was none other than Soul Calibur itself. From purified shards of Soul Edge, Soul Calibur was created for the sole purpose of defeating Soul Edge at any cost. Of course, gameplay-wise, its Soul Edge is opposite in terms of abilities, often giving you health instead. Which is why I'd rather take that, despite its mission to defeat Soul Edge, for better or for worse. Yeah, despite being a holy sword, it's not exactly lawful good, as shown in Soul Calibur V's hackmate story. Of course, now that the series has been rebooted, it remains to be seen if Soul Calibur will actually remain good this time. The sword, I mean, not the series. Before Konami hung Kojima out to dry, they seemed to have a really good thing going, what with Kojima's number one project being a staple for the company before they defecated on its corpse with a botched shift in genre and ridiculous late-stage capitalism. Before that, however, we got a spin-off featuring Raiden, the cyborg ninja who was saved from the scrappy heap, and fueled by purest platinum. Metal Gear Rising was a shift in genre that actually worked, taking the stealth-based series and creating a side story with a lot more action and no less complicated political intrigue and Raiden cut through all the bullshit with his trusty high-frequency blade. This is the only entry on this list that refers to a type of sword, but its unique properties give me a good reason to do so. Modeled after the traditional katana, the sword gets its name from its high oscillation, caused by an electrical current running along the blade. This vibration allows the sword to split matter at a molecular level, allowing it to cut through targets that would stop a normal sword in its tracks, like splitting a Metal Gear in half. They're also exceptionally durable, being able to parry a Metal Gear's attack, and people who are skilled enough with it can block bullets easily. Yeah, yeah, a normal sword can split bullets too if it's durable enough, but that frequency sure helps. Three particular models stand out here. Raiden's blade was upgraded to absorb electrolytes to restore his fuel cells, so that he can use blade mode to cut even armored enemies like grass, or ripper mode to go totally ape shit. Second, there's the HF Blade of Jetstream Sam, which was built from a razor-sharp Murasama blade to be sharp and durable enough to get through Armstrong's nanomachine, son. Something even Raiden's blade couldn't do. Interestingly enough, Sam modified the sheath with a piston to power up his quick-draw attacks. Real modern-day samurai, that guy. Last but not least, Great Fox's Blade, which was able to disable Metal Gear Rex and the Twin Snakes, can be unlocked in Rising, and it's even said to harbor the soul of the legendary warrior. Even in its default state, it can shred armor, bullets, and pretty much the game as a whole, basically like a permanent ripper mode, though I'd only recommend using it on a second playthrough. Don't want to make things too easy, right? Okay, funny thing. I was originally going to start this segment about how little we knew about the upcoming Kirby and the Forgotten Land, but as I was starting to edit this list, Nintendo decided to drop a new trailer on us, and it filled me with hype. Kirby with a drill, Kirby with a gun, saving Waddle Dees and building a town, co-op with the bandana bro, and WOO Meta Knight FUCK YOU! Yeah! Clearly Nintendo's masked man of mystery read up on how to be a badass. I'd say somewhere around the third chapter was about picking a godly weapon. You take one good look at Galaxia and you consider yourself lucky, because if Meta Knight wanted to fight you, your lawyer would be reading your will to your next of kin by this time tomorrow. 
Whether it appears in the form of a fantasy broadsword or a multi-pronged rip and tear stick, Meta Knight is never without his trusty blade. Ever since his first appearance in Kirby's Adventure, it's been by his side ready to tear shit up. The games themselves don't go too deep into the lore, but the anime gives it some interesting backstory. Apparently it was forged by the most hardcore bladesmith the universe had ever known, who gave it life and a will all its own. It was sealed away because Nightmare didn't figure out how to harness it, but in a sword in the stone fashion, it found its true master in our boy. At the cost of a comrade. The blade even exists on a separate plane of reality. Well, that certainly explains how the sword is so powerful. Also explains why Meta Knight himself is so badass. That blade is the source of all those crazy moves. The energy beams? Galaxia. The elemental powers? Yeah, that's Galaxia too. That crazy mock tornado? That ain't weather, Chief. Want to feel that power for yourself? Try playing Kirby and the Amazing Mirror. Aside from Meta Knight lending you its power to take down Dark Mind, this baby can be used for every type of puzzle and any type of combat situation. Close range, long range, this thing can do it all. And then there's Smash. Oh boy. Yeah, there's a reason that Meta Knight got banned in Brawl for all intents and purposes. If I had the power of a god holster to my hip, I'd be freaking Omageo. to fill your dark soul with light! No, Dante, not yet. You'll have your turn. What? It's not exactly much of a spoiler when you consider we're talking about Dante. In the meantime, have you ever danced with the devil in the pale moonlight? Oh boy, this is a can of worms I've been debating on whether or not to open for myself for some time. From Software has a notorious reputation for clamping gamers' genitals in a vice. Sometimes the brutal difficulty of these games is fair, and others... not so much. Dark Souls, Bloodborne, Sekiro... These games will scar your ass until you learn from your previous failures, get lucky somehow, or descend into rage-induced delirium. Of course, as dark as these worlds can get, the lore behind them is crazy. And of course, a world like this wouldn't be complete without legendary weapons to increase your chances of survival by about one zeptogram. One sword in particular that stands out is the Moonlight Greatsword. This weapon appears in all three Dark Souls games, and as a rare dragon weapon, has some unique properties that make it difficult to master, but worth the investment. Capable of one- and two-handed attacks, the Greatsword is actually a weapon that does magic damage due to its origin. The sword is cut from the tail of Seath the Scaleless, the dragon who betrayed his own kind and allowed for the Age of Man to begin in the first place. Well, cutting a sword from a monster's tail? Yeah, it gives you some Monster Hunter vibes there. Seath was the grandfather of sorcery, and as such, the sword boosts intelligence and magic defense. Its magical power is channeled through its heavy attack, which sends out a shockwave of magical power that explodes on contact, though at the cost of some durability. Its magical power, moveset, and low stat requirements made it popular for PvP, though it did get adjusted in the later two games in the series. Interestingly enough, this is Dark Souls' version of a sword that has existed in various forms through nearly all of From Software's titles, from Kingsfield, to Bloodborne, to even Armored Core. The only From Software game that doesn't have a form of the Moonlight Sword is Sekiro, and they said that's just to keep the aesthetic of the game. I find that to be a weak excuse. A Moonlight Katana would have been 100% badass and you all know it. Y'all are just being goddamn cowards! COWARDS I SAY! I have a Sparta. I have Rebellion. Ugh. I don't have Dante's durability or healing factor, so I can't exactly do this the way he did it. See, Dante? You didn't have to wait for too long. So, here's the deal. Prior to Devil May Cry 5, the legendary Devil Hunter has had two signature swords. In the first Devil May Cry game, he carried the self-named sword of his demon daddy Sparta, originally in the form of Force Edge. However, upon defeating Nello Angelo, he reunites the halves of his pendant and awakens the Sword of Sparta's true form. In Devil May Cry 2 and onward, we see Dante's real trademark, Rebellion. It's one of the swords that resulted when Sparta split his power into three different flavors, the other being Virgil's Yamato. Rebellion was awesome. It was totally metal, capable of crazy moves, lets Dante use Devil Trigger once it awakens by impaling himself, and it will not break. It broke. Well, now we have a problem. If we can't beat Yuri Zen with Rebellion, and we can't beat him with Sparta's sword, maybe we should try using both. Both? Both. Both. Both is good. Yeah, somewhere along the line, Dante actually uses logic. 
He knows that Yamato can separate human from demon, so naturally, Dante deduces that Rebellion can unite the two halves. So he does so, by impaling himself. Damn, that healing factor is something else. So now we have two swords fused into one, and if you thought the party was crazy before, now it's goddamn Mardi Gras. This new sword bears his name and looks like something straight out of Monster Hunter. Claws running up the side, talents for a cross guard, and a blood red jewel like an eye on the pommel. The Devil Sword Dante's abilities are off the chain. Start by taking several moves from Swordmaster Style and adding them to your base kit, with Swordmaster Style gaining whole new moves. But the real treat is the Swords Formation. Remember Virgil's Summon Swords from 3? Same deal. And the swords change function depending on your style, be it copying your moves for extra oomph, intercepting enemies, giving you an extra dash and extra air tricks, or boosting your guard ability. But the icing on the cake? Three words. Sin. Devil. Trigger. Aside from looking totally badass, this is Dante's strongest form yet. Aside from damaging everything nearby, this form gives you super armor, drastically reduced damage, its own dodge and teleport, and insane moves. Looks like the devil we know is more powerful than ever. This is the legacy you inherited, Nero. You've got a lot to live up to. Guess what this December is? That's right, it's Mega Man's 35th anniversary! Yeah! You all remember the 30th anniversary stream, right? The one where they revealed Mega Man 11 out of nowhere and I completely lost my shit? Yeah, we haven't gotten a new Mega Man game since then, but with Mega Man 11's success, Capcom could afford to take their time with the next game. Wily ain't going nowhere. Of course, the X series has been stuck at 8 for even longer. And no, the gacha does not count. Axel's stuck in an 18-year coma, and Zero's waiting to cut some Maverick bitches in half. Of course, whenever Zero does get called back into action, there's no doubt that he'll be carrying his trusty Z-Saber by his side no matter what he's fighting for. It's this powerful beam sword that makes Zero a perfect complement to X and his buster. And to be honest, this weapon really makes him complete. Before he got it, he had a buster like X, and come on, having the series ensemble Dark Horse simply be an X-clone just ain't right. He first got his Saber in X2, either for a boss fight or a cutscene, and in X3, where he became playable for the first time, it was a charge attack. But it was X4 where we first saw what that sword can really do. Similar to how X can gain the weapons of defeated Mavericks, Zero can learn their techniques and perform them with the Saber. And these techniques are iconic for him. With names that translate to stuff like Dragon Flame Blade, Ice Fury Slash, and Wave Sever Attack, this blade can channel energy like a blessing from the gods themselves. The blade tended to be fluid in its motion up until X5, after which the blade's shape became more solid, but either way, it slices, it dices, it shreds suckers to bits. Same goes for the Mega Man Zero series, and in fact, the sword got an upgrade. Sporting a new triangular blade, it can also be used while moving, charged up like it's the Monster Hunter Greatsword, and equipped with elemental chips for certain situations. Even better, it can be further customized, and in fact is the basis for the various rod weapons Zero can use throughout the games. Be it the Triple Rod's three-pronged attack, the Chain Rod's Indiana Jones mode, or the Recoil Rod and its push and pogo power, these modifications really speak to Servo's know-how and Zero's versatility. Need more, huh? Remember Marvel? Yeah, I'm sure at least some of you might. There's a reason why Team Zero May Cry was a thing in Ultimate. So there you go. Why is Zero so busted? Because he has the weapon of a Jedi Master. Only appropriate that he took down his world's version of Vader, the Death Star, and Palpatine. And there's plenty of enemies out there who really need to be divided by Zero! This is but one of the legends of which the people speak. Yeah, and I'm gonna talk about it again, because not talking about Zelda on a list of swords just doesn't feel right to me. Yeah, we Zelda fans are waiting with bated breath for any further news about the sequel to Breath of the Wild. Like, you know, a name? I mean, Breath of the Wild was part of the reason that the Switch's launch was hotter than the Flames of the Forge. And speaking of the Forge, if we're gonna talk about Zelda, it only makes sense to talk about the Blade of Evil's Bane, right? While there have been plenty of swords wielded by the various incarnations of Link, more than half of them being in Breath of the Wild and breaking after about an hour, talking about the Master Sword was not a matter of if, 
but when? Distinguished by its blue handle with a blue wing-shaped crossguard, a relief of the Triforce on the blade near the guard, and the inlaid yellow jewel, this magnificent bastard sword is easily recognizable. Originally crafted by the goddess Hylia, the sword was given its iconic form and gained the power to repel evil after the original Link forged it in the three flames of the goddesses alongside Fai, the sword's very own guardian spirit. Ever since, it has found its way into the hands of its chosen hero who is pure of heart and strong of body in a chain of reincarnation, with one Link after another finding his place in the legend. As a weapon worthy of a hero, the Master Sword is light enough to be wielded with one or two hands and is razor sharp, able to slice through monsters easily, and durable enough to withstand even the most punishing blows. A capable hero can perform a myriad of techniques from powerful spinning slashes, to helm-splitting strikes, and devastating counterattacks. But more impressive still are its mystical powers. Being the blade that banishes evil, it's capable of destroying magical barriers, dispelling dark curses, and even sealing away the remains of demons. Not to mention, it can be combined with light spirits to drive away the dark fog of the Twilight Realm. It also channels divine power through sword beams, including the mighty Skyward Strike. It's even been a key between the past and the future. Of course, it has a way of choosing who's worthy of claiming it. Those without pure hearts can't even touch the blade, and those who lack the strength to pull it out, well, will find themselves lacking life. It's basically another case of the Sword in the Stone scenario, or like Mjolnir, only to be wielded by one who is worthy. It's no wonder this sword is so well recognized. If a kid can use it to stab a king of evil in the face and turn him to stone, yeah, you're not gonna forget that. Now before we move on, here are several honorable mentions. The Energy Sword from Halo. De Nomos from Tales of Vesperia, The Crucible from Doom Eternal, Caliburn from Sonic and the Black Knight, The Blade of Olympus from God of War 2, Interfectum Malice Okami from Blaze Blue, The Honage Line from Pokemon Gen 6, Wonder Blue's Valiantium Blade from the Wonderful 101, several legendary Fire Emblem swords, and the Supreme Sword of Hose Mad from Dragon Quest. And now let's see what the rest of the Arcade Nation has to say with this month's patron picks. The Beam Katana is the weapon of choice for resident anime connoisseur and Takashi Miike superfan Travis Touchdown. Using multiple versions of it ranging from the lightning quick Tsubaki Mark III to the hard hitting Peony, Travis has more than one way to kill an assassin. Melee weapons aren't very common in Mega Man, but they're typically excellent. The Flame Sword from 8 can easily take on most minor enemies and is a big help against the Wily Capsule's first phase. It's also one of Mega Man's best moves in Smash Bros. It's a great sword that turns into twin daggers and discount blades of chaos. It's a very awesome weapon, if not for the fact that it slowly kills the wielder in the process. Gotta balance out the overpoweredness somehow. Firestorm Fury from Starbound. I love this sword that doubles as a flamethrower, setting enemies on fire while slashing them away. Trust me, if you weren't feeling it before, you'll be really feeling it now. Xenoblade Chronicles is one of my favorite games of all time, with its massive sense of scale, gripping story, wonderfully written characters and world, tactical gameplay, and absolutely killer soundtrack, there was a reason that this game is so beloved. And at the center of it all is the absolute coolest goddamn sword ever designed for a game. The Monado is one of the central elements in this game, and for more than just its futuristic look, though that doesn't exactly hurt. In its closed form, it appears as a red metallic sword with a layered glass disc at the guard. In battle, it opens up to reveal a lengthened ether blade to attack all sorts of enemies. But it's what this blade can do, as well as its history, that makes it so special. The Monado is the Sword of Bionis, the titan which fought with Makanis eons ago. How it shrunk to its current size borders on spoiler territory, and that is something I want to avoid, thank you very much. As the game opens, it's being wielded by Dunban, and while its powers are limited when he's armed with it, he's still able to hold off countless Mechon on his own, thanks to its power. Soon after, it finds its way to Shulk, where its true power begins to manifest, starting with its power to allow him to see into the future. This comes up many times throughout the game, both in story and in gameplay. Granted, the Monado can't cut people at first, after all, it's meant for Mechon, but as plot happens, it gets a power boost and the old rules no longer apply. But the gift of prescience is far from the Monado's only ability. You see, most characters in the game have access to a single talent art, 
which can be used once the gauge is full. Shulk has an entire palette full of arts that are exclusive to the Monado. Enchant boosts the team's power, especially against Mechon. Shield and Armor offer protection against damage. Speed can boost your team's evasion. Purge and Eater can debuff enemies. And if you just need to do some damage, then there's Buster and Cyclone. These abilities are unlocked throughout the game, each time awakening with a new symbol. There are even new Monado arts that are exclusive to Shulk's appearance in Smash. One which boosts his jumping power, and one which boosts the launching power of his strikes. And it's these abilities that play into why the Monado is number one on my list, because I believe this sword best encapsulates Doug Markita's philosophy on martial arts and swordsmanship. Remember what I said at the beginning? It's not about how many you destroy, but how many you protect. True, the Monado is capable of making mountains of scrap out of the Mechon hordes, but its true power lies in making sure you and your allies don't die on you. It will cut, it will strengthen, it will protect, and it will most definitely heal. Of course, you're probably never going to see a sword like this on Forged in Fire. I mean, they stick to historical swords anyway, but even then, a laser sword isn't exactly practical for a bladesmith, let alone in four days. Guess a cosplay replica will just have to do. I'm the Quarter Guy, and until next time, the arcade is closed. You want to know what really sucks? When some company goes through a ton of effort to make a game trailer, they make it look really good, make me absolutely excited for the game, and then it turns out to be an April Fool's joke. I mean, come on, man, it's not right to toy with gamers' hype like that. Oh, it's actually real? Well, sweet. Can't wait for it. Next time, QG at the Arcade, Moon Cresta. It's game time! Hey everyone, QG here. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Feel free to check out my Twitter and my Twitch streams, and consider supporting me through Patreon, and donating to my Extra Life campaign to support Children's Wisconsin. Thanks for watching.